Welcome to Attack on Power Hour. I'm your host and lead of MITRE Attack, Adam Pennington. If you aren't familiar with MITRE, we're a not-for-profit dedicated to solving problems for a safer world. Through our public-private partnerships and federally funded research and development centers, we work across government and with industry to tackle some of the world's biggest problems. If you're here, you've probably heard of Attack. The Attack knowledge base is open and available to any person or organization to use at no charge globally. Along with your link to today's session, you should have also gotten a Slack invite. If you're already in our Slack, please join the Attack Con Power Hour December channel. In that Slack, you'll find a channel dedicated to each talk by the speaker's last name. Please ask any questions you have for today's speakers there during and after their talk. Our very own Jamie Williams may ask your question live, or the speaker will have an opportunity to answer it in Slack after their talk. Attack flags have been a bit of an attack con tradition for in-person attendees the last few years. With this year's virtual conference, we only printed a much more limited quantity for speakers, but there are a few left. Uh, we're going to send one of them to whoever posts the best attack con tweets using the attack con hashtag during today's 90 minute session. One hint, we like good memes. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker of December's attack con power hour, returning attack con speaker, Valentina Palacine. Excellent. Hi everyone. Thank you Adam for the introduction. So I'm going to talk today about uh, a little app with, I developed with the thread mapping catalog. Um, well, we're going to talk what bring, a, bring me to start this project, um, what are the expectations, what is the reality of that, and what I'm planning to do in the future. Uh, so first, I'm going to talk about a little bit about me. Uh, I'm, I'm a thread analyst. I had a drug in translation. I'm trying to learn uh, how to be a good threat hunter. And also I usually do things of Python developing on my free time. Um, that's how this idea came around. Um, around the last year, uh, maybe some of you saw a presentation we did with Bruce Barbasil in Attack um, 2.0 about threat library. We did, repeated this presentation in other places in Latin America and trying to extend the attack um, knowledge to, to your Spanish speakers. And most of the well, question that we received a lot after those presentation was, how can I leverage something like this if I don't have a dedicated team? And it didn't got into the into the slide, but it, it, this question was followed by if and if I don't have a good a budget like to buy a threat intelligence field. So we start pinpointing and 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 we came up with this idea that was a thread mapping catalog, which actually is basically a link between the, uh, the thread report attack mapping tram and the attack navigator, which what we, this app will do is to leverage the attack uh, through the taxi server and, and the, we'll build all the information they, they have in the website into a database. It will, be, it will create the relations between that and then it will link if you want to add more information, you can use Trump to add more information, and you can also automatically build that, that same those mappings into the navigator. So my expectations when I started, I wish to, to I had to wish to do this all these things I see in the screen. I'm going I'm not going to get into them, um, but then 2020 happened and after a lot of nights in which I actually this actually happened to me and I woke up to do something like this by hand and a lot of screaming i cannot even understand what i wrote but um and a lot of time not doing why did i this to myself because um I, the pressure of the deadline was there plus everything that was going on it came up with some i came up with some athletics um i didn't meet every everything i wished i to accomplish um but for now the app is usable the links are there you can actually um, communicate between Trump and the navigator. You can load everything in of, um, of attack related. And the things that I couldn't manage to do by now, they're going to do it in the future. So the first time uh, you, the first thing you will need to do in order to use the app will be to clone, a modify attack navigator repo, a modify Trump repo and the app repo itself. And after registering and logging into the application, you're going to need to to access to the path first time. 
and then you will have to wait and wait some more because actually mapping everything and creating all the relationships for that for the attack takes about one and a half hours depending on where you are and and your internet connection so you will have to let it let it let it build but after that you will have something like this with them you can explore everything in attack fairly easily with uh, with the table and and also start looking for other things like um, the relationship between the data. Um, this is an example. You can also filter the data. If you have the list of the list of adversaries or the list of tools, you can filter for um, filter it and start looking what you want to do. And those actions there allow you to either edit the data, download it as an SCB, um, open it or open it into the navigator. This is an example of how the app works. When you click the link, it will you will open the navigator and it's not a, a, a pretty solution, but it works. The file with the mapping gets sent to the navigator through the URL will, will, that will issue a request to, a get request to the team to, to retrieve the file and open the layer. Then, well, just, this screenshot, it shows how you can edit the data you can also create new data and add, for example, in this case, you can add a new field, which would be the, the origin of the adversary, which will allow you to track the, the, the adversaries that you are loading based on the suspected of origin of it. In this screen, you can trigger the mapping, the um, tram interaction. So for this, you, you will load the, the adversary, the tool, if you know which tool, um, pro the related industry, if you know it, and when you pass when you pass the URL to to the input field and you click into map, this will trigger uh, the local build um, map uh, tram um, in server, and then you there will you have to you will have to do the process yourself, the mapping, the selecting the the techniques, uh, recording to maps. I thought about doing it automatically, but then you kind of um, do not allow Trump to learn from your selections. So I, I went through to this to the side. And when you finally move to the, the card to or the report to the complete column, it will trigger an issue back to the TMC with all the mapping that you have um, selected. So in that way, you will be able to look, look for it into the, the, the same database. Finally, you can explore all the relationships that are built within, as long as you are building data and also within the, the matri attack data that's already loaded. For example, here you can see adversaries for tools, um, tools for techniques. You can even, if you are tracking um, a lot of um, tra reports through terms, you can add a, a track events per industry. Also, you can uh, you can see a list of the most used techniques according to what is in the in the in the database, and in the future, I would like to add a lot of more stuff. Uh, but for now, uh, this is what we have. Um, in I would like to to have more relationships. For example, I think it's very interesting to study um, how the adversaries evolve in time. Maybe the dates in which the campaigns are are happening, uh, where the so we can study the, the evolution of the techniques of the adversaries. I would like to avoid having the user loading everything through Tram. And if someone wants to outload its own mapping outside Tram, I will want them to be able to do it. And also uh, one thing that I didn't mention that it's not possible to do right now is to edit the relationship that are already in the, in the database through the user interface. That's a uh, goal in the future. I will also like to dockerize everything to make it easy for deployment. And finally, some maybe some um, graphics or something to be study better what the adversaries are doing. As a final goal, um, we, through, we talk a lot about translating attack into Spanish. So the, these, the, the whole goal of this, pro the, of this project was to help those um, companies, uh, small companies or companies with, with not a lot of resources 
to leverage threat intelligence. And one way to do it too is to translate an attack to make it more available to Latin American speakers and um, to Spanish speakers in general. And this project will be part of the OTR community. And so everyone that wants to collaborate can, can collaborate there and, and keep improving it. But for now, after everything that happened in this 2020 and we've been working with this and all, all other stuff, I think I'm gonna take a, a well-deserved vacation and keep, maybe we will resume developing and in, improving the functionalities of the TMC uh, after January. So that's kind of all for my part. If you have any questions and if you want to reach me, there are my, my networks, Twitter and LinkedIn. And I will be happy to answer anything you have for me. Thanks for sharing. And um, first and foremost, thank you for taking the time and like actually taking all the knowledge that you have and building something that community can the community can use. And, you know, it takes a lot, you know, of personal time and you know, late hours and a lot of learning, as you said. You know, and I think your skill sets, you know, uh, really useful and it's really impactful when you actually put something in people's hands that they can, you know, actually harvest. Um, you know, all of the lessons and experience that you've acquired over the years. But I think my first question is, we've had a lot of interest even in the Slack channel, so you'll have to see it already uh, when you, after this talk, but how, how can people get involved? I know it's really exciting that you just published this stuff on GitHub. Are you looking for people to kind of come in and do testing for you, do yes. you contributions, or how can people yes. kind of help out this? Uh, for sure, I mean, I love it. Um, I did as much as I can. I'm a soft, kind of a soft developer, so... I'm really looking forward to feedback and to ways to improve things that are already built. And, and also, I am not an expert in, in, in JavaScript and Angular, that is everything that's navigator related. So I think there's a lot of potential to build more things and to connect the app better. And, and I would love to, to, to have these contributions. And that's also a goal, what, what I, I presented, because I think that the importance and, and what I wanted to do was to be able to give something to people to, to leverage CTI in, in a useful way. And for that, it has to be something public and something something that everyone can <laughs> contribute to. Yeah, exactly. And like I said, I think the, you have the most important thing, like I said, the, the skills with coding and stuff, that'll all develop over time, but the vision to say like, this is what where we need to be, this is what you know the problem is. So speaking towards that, you know, um, for those people who might've missed your presentation last year for with Ruth, um, you know, as a small organization or a small shop, um, you know, why, how does intelligence help me? Like, what should I be doing with that? How do I actually, you know, apply intelligence about adversaries mm -hmm. towards my goals? Um, I think if you focus into, into building a good data, data set of information that is relevant to you, you can um, probably manage better the, res the, the small resources you have to dedicate it to the things that are more critical and crucial for your organization. That instead of trying like, you know, to, to swim in the dark and maybe find what the, the way. Yeah, that makes sense. Like a prioritization and saying, you know, there's just so many things to worry about, but like I said, your, your approach of like understanding, you know, what things are most likely to happen to me. And then, you know, what things are, you know, most relevant for me that kind of helps, you know, make, you know, a huge effort, maybe something that we can, you know, address in a day-to-day -day perspective. Um, I know another thing that people are really, really loving is your idea of translating attack to Spanish. I think I've, I've heard some rumors about this. Uh, can you speak a little bit towards that? And, you know, both yes. in terms of how people can get involved as well as the impact of it. I think it's yes. a really, um, really notable um, effort. So actually, this is a project that born uh, in a discussion with Ruth. Um, and we had been planning on this for a year. We have we have building something that's going to be called Open Sec Library with the with the idea to translate more content into Spanish and even if to into other languages. Uh, we'll be all managed through OTR, which is Open Thread Research. They can find it, can be find it in Twitter. Um, we will do uh, GitHub repositories in which people can collaborate to with translation for attack and also is, we are going to have uh, projects for translating other stuff uh, into Spanish too. Awesome. That sounds amazing. So definitely thank you for your time and thank you for, for sharing all your ideas. Def, um, hop over to Slack and there's some great um, comments and questions there, but you know, thanks again. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Adam and to introduce our next speaker. Yeah. And, and thank you both uh, Jamie and Valentina. So up next, we have our only 30 minute speaker of this month's session. 
uh, Attack alumna and Red Canary Zone, Katie Nichols. Thank you so much, Adam. It is such a pleasure to be here at AttackCon Power Hour. Of course, I wish we were all in person. I will miss those uh, panic attack cocktails from last year, but such a pleasure to be here with you today in this crazy year to share some knowledge. As Adam said, my name is Katie Nichols, and I'll be talking to you today about how my attack perspectives have changed this year. And kind of relevant to know that I used to be on the MITRE ATT&CK team, and so I'll be talking to you about how over this year, moving from the theory of being on the MITRE ATT&CK team to practice at Red Canary has changed my thinking a little bit. So hopefully I'll give you something new to think about today as well. Important things out of the way first, this is being recorded. The slides will be shared. I do not know when, but I'm confident that the MITRE team is gonna get on it as quickly as I possibly can. So there you go. You don't have to ask that at all throughout the presentation. It is being recorded. There will be slides. Do not fear, all is well. A little bit about me, as I said, I'm Katie and I'm the Director of Intelligence at Red Canary, which if you're not familiar, we're known for our managed detection and response. We also do cool projects like Atomic Red Team and Atomic Test Harnesses, which I'll talk about today. And I joined Red Canary in December, rather January 2020. So about a year ago, it's been uh, an interesting change. Before that, I worked at MITRE on the attack team for several years and as you can probably tell by the fact that I'm here, left on pretty good terms. So it's such a pleasure that I've been able to stay in touch with the team and be part of this attack community in a different way. I love threat intelligence. That's what I do day to day. I get to look at all the awesome data and information and try to track threats and use that information to inform decisions, which is what threat intelligence is. When I'm not working for Red Canary, I also teach for the SANS Institute, their cyber threat intelligence course. That's a lot of fun. And I don't always work and do threat intel things, I promise. Uh, when I'm not doing work things, I enjoy home organization. That is my newfound hobby from this year. Um, I am a huge home edit fan. So for anyone else who likes the home edit, you might appreciate this photo of my beautiful breakfast shelf. My teas are organized in rainbow order, and I do not apologize for that. Um, I also really like to work out. I work out on my back deck lately, and holiday lights make that a lot more fun. So pro tip, throw up some lights. Regardless of what holidays you celebrate, lights make these dark evenings better. That's a little bit of context about me. Again, kind of important to know that I used to be on the MITRE team. So my pleasure to come back again this year with a different hat on. Different perspectives can help you think differently. That's the theme of this talk. And you might be familiar with this image. You might've seen this one before. This is an image that can either be a young woman or an old woman, depending on your perspective. So the one that I see first is actually the young woman. So right here, you see her eyelashes, her face, she's kind of turning to the side, like a feather from her hat or whatever, her hair. And so I see the young woman. But if you look at it a different way, from a different perspective, you can actually see an old woman, right? Here's her nose and here's her hair and maybe her eye and something on her head. So is it a young woman or is it an old woman? Which is the right answer? Of course, there is no right answer. It's both at the same time. And the theme of this image and this presentation is really that you can have different perspectives on things. And it's good to change your thinking, to change your perspectives. And sometimes to change our perspectives, we need someone else. We need someone to point out that, hey, that would be the old lady's nose if you looked at it that way. Changing the situation we're in can help us change our thinking, which is not a bad thing. Maturing and changing how we think is a good thing. So today this is AttackCon, so I'll be talking to you about how my perspectives have changed over this past year on attack specifically. As I've gone from the theory of, you know, helping the team maintain the framework and speaking about it to putting it into practice in my role at Red Canary. I'll be chatting about three different areas where I've had quite a big change in perspective. First off, tracking TTPs and how sometimes it's helpful to go beyond those three object types. Next one detection coverage, how I thought about it before, how I've changed my thinking and 
honestly, on this one, my thinking is going to continue to change. So I'll dive into that. And then last but not least, my thinking and my change in perspective on how we choose what to detect. So three different areas. Let's dive right in. First one, thinking through TTPs. The way that I'm used to tracking TTPs, and I was at MITRE, solid foundation for the MITRE attack framework. We got our tactics, high level goals, our techniques and sub techniques, how those goals are achieved, and then our procedures, the specific implementation. I know you all know attack, so I won't give you a full briefing. So this is the example technique and sub techniques we'll be working through today as an example. Tactic defense evasion, our technique signed binary proxy execution, our sub technique MSHTA, which I like to say Mishta, take it or leave it. It's fewer syllables, much more efficient to say. That's our sub technique Mishta. This is a uh, signed binary proxy uh, or binary executable rather in Windows, as we can tell from that technique name. It's meant to execute legit things, Microsoft HTML applications, but of course, like a lot of these built-in executables, adversaries also like to use it to execute bad code. That's our technique and sub-technique for today. So we got our tactic, our technique, and sub-technique of Mishta and our procedure. For example, the open source framework Codic can use Mishta to serve up additional payloads. So tactic, technique, procedure, and a side note, I love me some threat intel. So threat intel note for you, Codic. If you're not familiar, go check out that framework. It's a post-exploitation open source framework, kind of like um, Empire, Metasploit, that kind of thing. Um, but we've seen a few ransomware operators use that recently. So it's a good one to look at and make sure you can detect. So, okay, threat intel side note out of the way. So this is what I was used to at MITRE. You know, adding to those group and software pages for years, but the MITRE team has thankfully continued tactic, technique, and procedure. It's simple, it's elegant, it works as a standard. Then I got to Red Canary and started looking at our detections that look something like this. So this is an example detection for Codic. All right, we got our tactic up here. That's nice and familiar, defense evasion. We got our technique of Mishta right there, the technique ID. And then we have kind of the meat of the detection, right? You see the telemetry, task engine spawning Mishta. Then you have the exact command line here. And then this is what we call at Red Canary an annotation, right? The analyst explained, here's what's happening. The command's executing VB script to launch Mishta, make an external network connection. So thinking through, okay, I got my tactic at the top, got that technique below it. And then I would kind of consider this annotation to be a procedure. So we'll call it a procedure, but then I was kind of faced with this challenge of there's this extra telemetry here, all right, this exact command line. What's that? We could say that that's part of the procedure, certainly is, but in this case, you know, I think of the procedure maybe as a little higher level and it might be useful for us to break out that specific command line. With that use case in mind, what my team decided to do is all right, let's think beyond those TTPs. We got tactics, techniques, procedures. Let's add on a fourth level of observables. That's that exact telemetry, the exact command line. And for us, tracking that separately than the higher level procedure is really, really useful, as we'll talk about. So observables, we're adding on, and now we have four different levels of granularity. TTPs plus O. So TTPO it rolls right off the tongue, right? Here's an example. I always like examples, helps you understand what I'm saying here. So we got our tactic. In this case, we're gonna say that this applies under multiple tactics. We can do that. Tactic and technique and procedure. And then we just tack on our observable because that's important for us, for my team to track the exact telemetry that was used underneath that procedure. All right, not too bad. We got TTPO four different levels now. My team, we're the intelligence team, so of course we track a bunch of different threats, groups, and malware. And so this year, and even prior to when I joined the team, they're working on how do we write up what we know about these threats in the form of profiles. And so as I joined the team, we were having some interesting discussions about 
how do we format these profiles? What structure do we use? Do we want to, you know, write it like a blog post with pros? Do we want to have a table where we list out TTPs? How do we want to format these profiles? And as I so often say when I'm talking about threat intelligence, we tried to go back to our requirements. What were our needs? So checking out, this is the format that we kind of settled on for now, at least. At the top, we have our tactic. We found it was useful to kind of divide out by tactic so you can see what the adversary did for each of those high level goals. You might notice that what's next is not a technique. And this is where I remember the Zoom call where we discussed this as a team and I said, look, you know, for my MITRE background, I'm used to being tactic and then technique and then procedure. And so I really think that's the way we should do it. Thank goodness my team kind of shifted my perspective and gave me a different way to think about it. And they said, Katie, well, I respect that. You have that background, but what if you think about not putting the technique under the tactic, but instead putting that procedure as the key object in our profile? And I was like, well, you know, I don't really like that, but fine, I'm willing to compromise, let's do it. And I'm really glad I did because what we found over time as we started building out these profiles of different threats was it's actually really useful. When you have this procedure, right, this high level procedure here, then we have the observable or maybe multiple observables that apply to that procedure. We want to track that. Then under that, we have detectors, which is our term for detection analytics. What analytics might help us catch the adversary or the threat using that procedure? So. We have three for this example, and we also note, are they targeted to this specific threat or are they applicable more broadly? Kind of a good thing to track for us. So we have our observable, we have our detectors, and we say, well, we wanna track any additional tactics. You might've noticed we added primary tactic up here. So, okay, this procedure primarily falls under execution, but well, we know multiple tactics can apply at once. And so defense evasion, the adversary is also evading defenses as they do that execution. And then all the way down here, we add in our techniques, Mishta and Visual Basic. This is where kind of you can start to see the power of using the procedure as kind of our main object here, because if we were using technique as our main object, we'd have to divide this out and have Mishta as one technique, Visual Basic as another. But because we're applying these to the procedure, and they both apply at the same time, it's kind of nice to not have to duplicate that information. Again, this format might not work for everyone, but this is an example of how I kind of altered my thinking, shifted my perspective when faced with a new challenge. And hey, we still have TTPs, but we thought a little bit beyond that to observables and the specific format we use for tracking threats. So I said, what this lets us do is meets our needs. We wanna track that detailed telemetry. And so we can do that with observables. We can also do something really, really important, try to detect where we have detection coverage. For what observables or procedures for known threats, can we detect those things? And where do we have gaps that we really need to fill? It's a beautiful marriage of threat intelligence and detection that just makes me really happy. At the same time, right? We added on that observables idea. We used our own format for profiles, but we're still using tactic, techniques, subtechniques, and procedures. So we can still get the value of attack communicating as a common language, but add on because for our needs, it made sense too. So in summary, that's kind of our first key section. Shifted my perspectives on TTPs, changing that up, adding a little bit of extra goodness. Next key thing that I've changed my perspectives on, detection coverage. Just that concept of what does detection coverage mean? Throughout this year, it's been a fun journey and I've had help from my friends, of course, thinking about what does that mean and how can we get more granular? So we'll dive into that in this section. As I left MITRE, this is what I thought. This is one of the ideas that I had that I still believe is a solid approach. Um, this slide is from a presentation I gave with my friend Ryan Kovar at Black Hat, one of my favorite presentations, a lot of fun. And with a hat tip to our friend Olaf, we said a great way to describe detection coverage is using confidence levels, right? Maybe you use a single shade or multiple shades of blue. It's darker blue when you're more confident that you could detect that technique. It's lighter blue when you're less confident or you don't think you could detect that technique. 
we recommended this over the approach of maybe just calling you know the technique green we have it covered because sometimes people think that green means done and green doesn't really mean done green means maybe you're more confident but it's not done so we suggested hey use a single color whatever your favorite color is i'm going to use teal for the rest of the presentation because that's my favorite color to express your confidence in your detection coverage Another belief that I held when I left MITRE in January 2020 is that there are unlimited procedures. And I still believe this. It's still true. I wrote this blog post, my final blog post at MITRE, where I talked about being a savvy attack consumer, how you have to remember that any technique can have unlimited procedures by adversaries. I was thinking of techniques like masquerading. An adversary could masquerade as any software, any tool, they could give it any name, they could, you know, there are almost infinite possibilities there, unlimited procedures that an adversary could use to implement a technique. I still believe that, but this idea that I had was sort of limiting my thinking, unlimited procedures. It was limiting my thinking at least until I met my teammate, Matt Graber. So February timeframe, we all headed out for our quarterly on-site in Colorado, Red Canary headquarters, and we were walking from the hotel to the office. It was a very snowy Colorado morning, very cold. And as Matt's and Katie's do, when they meet each other, they talk about attack and procedures and testing. So we we're having a spirited conversation about attack and some of Matt's ideas for how you could test different techniques and procedures. And at some point I said something like, well, but you can't really test every procedure because there are unlimited procedures. And Matt, in a very kind, you know, approachable way, as he does, said, well, are there unlimited procedures? Is it really unlimited? And is it unlimited for every technique? Because think of techniques like Mishta or Run DLL 32, Rundle 32, if you'd prefer. I don't actually say that, just Mishta. Think of techniques that are binaries maybe there are only so many flags or options, so many ways you could execute Mishta. And so maybe for some techniques and sub-techniques, we could do a better job scoping them than just saying they're unlimited procedures. And I was like, all right, Matt, that's a very interesting point. You know, the first day I wasn't sure if I kind of bought into it. Second day I wasn't sure, but over weeks and months, I. I kind of started thinking about it and I was like, okay, maybe we can. So this is this concept that maybe we can break even sub techniques into more granular parts. We have this challenge of how we define detection coverage. So let's dive into one option that I've cha changed my thinking to learn about this idea of variations. When we left off, we had our TTPO, our tactics, techniques, procedures, and we had added in observables. After talking to Matt, I kind of changed up my thinking and added in a new level, this idea of variations. Now we think of a variation as an option that an adversary has based on those technical components of that technique or sub-technique. What options do they have that they might be limited to based on what we know about that technique or sub-technique? I should note that's a working definition. Um, we've been talking about this ongoing the entire year, and I'm sure our thinking will change. So don't uh, don't get mad later if, if that definition changes. But think of these as the options an adversary can choose from. Five different levels of granularity now. TTVPO rolls right off the tongue. I'm sure that's going to catch on really quickly. Again, examples help. Here are nine known variations of HTA. So our awesome research team, my teammates dove into all of the things about Mishta and HTA and came up with, okay, what are the options available to an adversary based on the scope they found, which is just known things. This could always change if Microsoft changes Mishta and how it works, it could change. But right now, here's what we know about the options available to an adversary. And we're defining these as variations. Lots more about this in a blog post that uh, Matt just wrote this week. Check that out. Also check out atomic test harnesses, which are key to understanding this concept and why it matters so much to talk about these variations. All right, so variations, different options an adversary has within those techniques or sub-techniques. 
let's do an example. When we left off, you know, we had this TTPO thing. So all we've done in here is added in our variations. All right, within that Mishta subtechnique, an adversary can specify which protocol handler to use. That just makes that inline command execution possible. And they can also choose to, all right, let's do a direct download from a URI. Two different variations under Mishta that an adversary can choose. Okay, let's see if those variations can map to the stuff below it, our procedure and our observable. Specifying the protocol handler, well, yep, in this case, that's VB script, and that's there in our observable too. And then the next variation, direct download from a URI, well, that's going to be represented by the external con network connection we mentioned in our procedure. And then there it is right there in our telemetry, in our observable. Sounds crazy, right? But maybe it's not so crazy because we felt like for us, it was useful to break things down past just our tactic, technique, and procedure levels, adding in variation and observable. And why this is so useful is because if you can figure out all the different variations, those options an adversary has available to them, you can start to mix and match them. Think of it like a Mr. Potato Head, which I know it's ridiculous, you know, you would never put Mr. Potato Head on an attack slide, craziness, but stay with me on Mr. Potato Head. Maybe we say, you know, Mr. Potato Head's ears, those specific pink ears are the specific uh, URI that an adversary used for direct download. All right, well, I wanna make my Mr. Potato Head, Mr. Potato Head a little bit hipster. And uh, so I'm gonna add some hipster glasses to him. I'm gonna specify my protocol handler, BB script. Maybe you decide he's a little too hipster. So let's uh, ditch those glasses, deal with it. Adversary chose a different variation. Now they have the deal with it glasses and they're gonna use J script instead of VB script. And it's kind of funny, right? I hope you enjoyed the deal with it glasses. I'm pretty proud of this slide. The point here is that an adversary can mix and match these different variations, just like a Mr. Potato Head. And so what we can do once we have these nine scoped variations, mix and match them, see how many different Mr. Potato Heads we can create, and then make tests for those and run atomic tests for each of those variation combinations. Dive into that. So for example, if you use the atomic test harness that Matt and the team have created for Mishta, you try all the different combinations available there, you're gonna get 25 different tests. So what we can do is say, well, we really wanna to get to a granular level of detail on this sub-technique. And so let's try out 25 different tests using atomic test harnesses. And out of those 25, some of them we detected, some of them we didn't. So fill in with whatever color you like, right? 25 total tests, teal means we got it, white means we didn't. So that is opportunity for improvement. This was helpful to us to have this more granular approach rather than just the high level, right? One technique, one color, that works sometimes for some use cases, right? Maybe you just wanna talk more generally about that. But for us, it really helped us to get a little more granular. Thinking about another way to think about detection coverage. All about thinking here, changing those perspectives. You could, track detection coverage more generally by is the technique used by a certain adversary, right? But maybe you wanna get a little more detailed with those observables. So we'll dive into how you can approach this from a threat perspective as well. Remember that profile breakdown I gave you, right? We had the procedure as our key object, then we had observables, detectors, and techniques. Well, as we're thinking about our detection coverage for our sub-technique of the day, Mishta, Maybe we combine and we say, okay, for every profile, every threat like Kodik or Fin7 that uses Mishta, let's grab that observable and see, could we detect that observable or not? If you pulled all that information together, you might get something like this. And so you can see we have six different threat observables for Mishta, right? We have two from Kodik, we have two from Fin7, we have one from Kovtur, one from Lazarus. So for these six observables, maybe these are the threats that matter most to us. We can say, all right, codec observable one, 
we can detect that, but there's another observable we've seen in the wild from other reporting that we can't detect, right? Same thing moving along. And so when you break down beyond just that sub-technique level to these specific observables used by different threats, you can start to track what can we detect and not detect. Again, this is just a more granular approach than the higher level technique or sub-technique coverage. So I've talked to you about variations and how that can help us with detection coverage. I talked to you about threat observables. What's the right way, Katie? What's the right way for us to explain detection coverage? If you know me, you can probably tell that I'm going to tell you there is no right way. It depends on what you're trying to approach. If you're trying to explain your coverage to leadership, this might work really well. Use your favorite color like teal or blue or orange for any weirdos, right? Explain to leadership at a high level. Darker means we're more or less confident in our coverage of these techniques. That is perfectly okay to do. Maybe they ask you, hey, why is that a signed binary proxy execution cell? Why is it that lovely shade of teal? Well, then you can zoom in and say, great question. Well, that's a parent technique. Turns out there are all these different binaries under that, including Mishta and run DLL32, which we have pretty good coverage on, but there are a lot of these other binaries that we don't cover so well. Having a more granular conversation if they ask, if you need to. We can even go deeper though, as we've talked about, maybe someone wants to know, why is Mishta that lovely shade of teal? Well, from there, we have this high level Mishta subtechnique that we can break into our tests and our threat observables. So if you wanna get even more specific, you wanna have some data, something behind why you chose that shade of teal, use the results of the tests that you ran, maybe 25 of them, if there are more you can figure out, and then also bring in that threat intelligence component, of course, and think about for the threats we care about, what observables have we seen from them in the past? And how well do we do to detect those? Dive as deep as you need to meet your need, right? For high level leadership, it's gonna be different than talking to your defenders in the weeds. We're looking at telemetry. So both approaches are okay. Any approach to describe detection coverage, whatever works for you, go for it. Regardless of the approach you take, it's just hard to express coverage. Hopefully I've given you some ideas, but there are limitations to whatever way you decide to express it. And there's no right or wrong way, but maybe there is a better or worse way. Maybe based on your needs, your requirements, you could find a more effective, more granular way that's gonna help people understand what you're trying to get at when you say detection coverage. So as always, think about your needs and your requirements for detection coverage. and. Hopefully I've given you some ideas to help you change up your own perspective on coverage. This is something that means different things to different teams and think a little deeper, change up your perspective. It might help you come to a deeper understanding of how detection covers matter, coverage matters for your team. That brings us to our final section, the final area where my thinking has changed quite a bit. And this is on choosing what you detect. I understood this when I was at MITRE, but I understand it to a new level that finding good detection opportunities is a huge challenge because not everything is necessarily useful to detect on. For example, uh, this is an image from a blog post my team wrote on a bizarre backdoor and how it leads to Cobalt Strike and would eventually lead to Ryuk. User opens up a PDF attachment and clicks a link. Those might not be great things to detect on. You know, maybe you have atomic indicators for a link, something like that. But in terms of behaviors, like clicking on links is probably not going to be a great detection opportunity. But good detection opportunities might include process hollowing or enumerating domain trusts, which we'll talk about. So, so something that I had to change my thinking on. I realized it was tough. I didn't realize that most of the struggle of creating detection analytics, honestly, was in deciding which techniques should we even try to detect on? Something that I often said and I thought when I left MITRE was, well, discovery techniques as a whole tactic, yeah, they're not really that useful for detection. And this is a slide from my Black Hat presentation with Ryan where we kind of made fun of a team and their struggles where 
they were like, well, let's detect on task list. Every time someone runs task list on a machine, let's detect on that. And of course they get flooded with alerts because task list happens a lot. So that's just one example of an observable for a discovery technique. Admittedly, some discovery techniques are not that great for alerting things like task list and IP config, gonna be pretty noisy in all environments, but I needed to change my perspective because I had kind of thrown out the baby with the bathwater and I thought, well, discovery techniques, not that useful. Well, except when they actually are. This is where I had a new perspective, right? When I got to Red Canary and I started to see lots of different detections on you know, precursors to ransomware, for example, what we found was that some discovery techniques like domain trust discovery were actually useful for detection. So here are a few different examples of how adversaries have used NL test to do domain trust discovery. And for us, we found that this NL test detection analytics, these analytics we have are actually fairly useful to try to detect badness, more high fidelity than maybe some of those other discovery techniques. So this is a lesson I had to learn of, you know, let's not throw out all discovery techniques from the tactic some of them might be more or less useful to detect on. And of course, as always, depends on your environment. I also learned that in addition to just choosing the detection analytics you wanna write, which techniques to write them for, doing that testing and tuning is a ton of work. So came into Red Canary January, 2020, you know, super fresh and excited. And I was like, I have an idea for detection analytic. This should never happen in an environment. So let's search for this command line or this behavior. And as many of you can probably tell, a lot of times that results in our kind detection engineers telling me, Katie, that really didn't work. We just got flooded with events. Okay, so over this year, I've started to learn a little bit, little bit more and say, okay, rather than just suggesting this analytic, let me suggest a hypothesis for what I think might be a good analytic. And let's have like, five or six backup plans, sometimes based on what adversaries have done. Ooh, that high level behavior isn't great for detection. How could we narrow that down a little bit more? This testing and tuning is a huge, huge challenge when you're trying to implement analytics. So remember that, that that first hypothesis is just part of the battle. And don't get frustrated if you have noisy analytics. Think about, is it always this same username or command line or host? Could you tune it out and suppress it? Or could you narrow things down based on what adversaries are doing? That's where threat intelligence is a beautiful addition. As we wrap up, a couple takeaways that I wanna leave you with. The overall idea here is that it's good to change your perspectives. It's good to change your thinking. And sometimes you don't need a job change to do that. Maybe you just need to get on a different team or different project or work on something new or hire a new person who challenges your status quo thinking. For attacks specifically, maybe some of the ideas that I shared are useful, but maybe for you, you know, you think a little more deeply about TTPs and you expand beyond that to meet your needs. Maybe you think, a little differently about detection coverage, some of the ideas I've given you or how you can define detection coverage for your team based on your needs and your requirements. And of course, that challenge of figuring out what do we even detect on? Ultimately, a lot of experience, trial and error and learning and teamwork are gonna help you figure out good detection opportunities, but changing your perspectives and listening to your teammates who've done this sometimes can be helpful. In closing, it is a good thing to change up your perspective. Surround yourself with people who think differently. Diversity is the spice of life. And with that, I think I'm probably running a short on time. So cheers to everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I think that was really powerful in the sense of capturing, you know, attack newbie, power user, whatever you call yourself, how to make attack your own, whether it's, you know, um, and the different perspectives from, you know, where you are in terms of maturity, as well as the different use cases, like uh, Kay was highlighting, you know, whether you're coming it from a red teaming, where you're coming from a detection, tracking threats, trying to describe, define coverage. There's so many different perspectives and you just have to really think about, you know, attack as a foundation, but you know, you're building on top of that. And what do you really need and how do you make, you know, all of these observables and indicators and all this data we have, how do you really make it your own? So you know, I, I myself was wild. I, I didn't even have, I was struggling to come up with questions that were more than just thank you, thank you. That was uh, pretty fantastic. So um, yeah, that was, that was great. 
I really like this this talk. Um, uh, looking at it and talking with Katie about it ahead of time, where it, it sort of has the dual themes: one of of sort of the growth and learning about um, gaining new perspectives, as well as some of the specific technical tips, getting into um, different ways to look at attack. And I also learned that I know I am personally a Mishta guy. Um, didn't realize that wasn't common. So uh, I think there's another fire out there starting uh, similar to Tab versus Spaces on uh, how to how to approach that one. Uh, so we're going to move on to our, our next speaker who who wins the farthest away contest today, and uh, by far the latest at night. Um, so I'd like to introduce Hugh Tran. Uh, hi everyone. Thank you for being here. It's my pleasure to be a speaker in majority. Major tech on power hours. So my name is Hyo Chun, and right now I'm working for APT Cybersecurity Divisions. Uh, I have been working for APT for more than four years, and my major responsibility is threat detection engineering and uh, incident responder. So my presentations can be divided into five parts. Uh, the first one is the threat detection and the Threat hunting. What is the difference between two of them? The next and uh, is the how about the threat hunting methodology and how we can use and leveraging major attack frameworks to be a common language for everyone, every threat hunters. Then last but not least is the case studies for one of our customer in the last years. We have to do threat hunting and incident response service for them and uh, key takeaway for this uh, presentations. So let's come to the first part. I think everyone uh, in this meeting know about the threat hunting, it's the human drivers with the support of technology to find the best thing happen in your organizations. So uh, what's the difference between the threat detection and threat hunting? What is the main difference? Let's take a look at the threat detections uh, people may know about threat detection like some kind of reactive approaching. You guys may, people can buy some automating technology such as CM, intrusion detection system, IDS, IPS, antivirus, or Accenture and Accenture. Basically, the three threat detection is uh, using the automation tool with some rules and uh, static tool to warning us about the, some bad thing happen. And uh, the main benefit of this kind of approach is the least expensive to the other ones. Uh, in the contrast, is the threat hunting. Uh, in threat hunting, is normal is human driven with the proactive human try to find the best stuff happen in our in our organizations. And you can see that uh, the threat hunting can help us to identify the detection graph when we when we try to do threat detection and may help us to create new detection contents. That should be enable the threat detection engineer and enable our threat hunters. But in the the main disadvantage of this threat hunting approach is the we need the security experts for hunting, for searching, for leveraging for leveraging our tools, and it's quite slow and expensive. So uh, in the threat hunting and threat detection, uh, in the last year, in the last three years, we uh, already know about so much about tank to measure. We know so much about the TTP tactic, technique, and procedures. Uh, like threat detection, threat hunting are also looking for the touch of the campaign. We're looking for tactic, technique, and processes. Sometimes we may looking for the adversary tools or network host artifact, but normally we are only looking for the tactic, technique, and procedures. I like to share the the next uh, slide because I uh, always tell my teammate that number tell its own stories. And let's take a look at the number that you well time of how could we detect and how long does it take to detect an attacker in our organizations. You can see that in 2019, it take uh, or, or almost 30 days to detect some guys uh, hacking our system, exfiltration, some data out of our organization. So it's, it's too long. And it's take too long to detect the bad guys in our organizations. 
I have read some Twitter from very, very great article from Microsoft when they try to uh, dispatch a honeypot on the internet. Uh, it's only take the attacker for almost three hours from the beginning they, they take, uh, they can remote in that uh, honeypot, they can exfiltration all the, uh, all the data out and finally they can destruction by deploy some ransomware in, in that honeypot, only three hours. So in 30 days, who know what can be happen to our organization, right? For the threat hunting methodology, I think uh, I think uh, people now so they get uh, a, a lot of thing to talk about threat hunting. But I love to talk about each methodology. Basically, the threat hunting we go into four phase, and the most important phase, in my opinion, is the how could we creating our hypothesis. And if you look at the cycle, the the next phase is the Based on our hypothesis, we can investigation using tools, using different kind of approaching to investigate, to, to analyze the data. And we might uncover new tactic, technique or processes on uncover new patterns that the threat detection might miss. Uh, from that, we can uh, inform and enrich our threat detection program or we can develop some like guy threat hunting procedures. And this might be great for our team, both threat hunter and both threat detection engineers. Uh, I must have a thanks, a big thanks and uh, a thumbs up for micro attack frameworks because uh, in the last three years, we use it like a common language for all our teams. And I think we can believe that micro will come, will become a common language for all the threat hunters all around the world. When talking to Mitro, I always talk about the PowerShell because uh, in all in almost four years, I have been tracking and and I have seen that most of our incidents occur when the adversary leveraging the PowerShell technique. Different adversary have different style when they using the tools and using the techniques. So APT32 may use the PowerShell very dis different from the Fin6 or the Fin7. So Mitro Attack Framework provides us a huge knowledge base about how the adversary can leverage that, that technique, how can they use to attack our system. And uh, that uh, make a lot of sense for any threat hunter or any threat detection engineers. So. Uh, I want to talk about a little bit about my case study last year when our team comes on and uh, do the incident response and threat hunting for one of our customers in Vietnam. I think it's a pretty large customer in Vietnam. So about the customer situation at that time is the last enterprise with huge number of endpoints, maybe 7,000 or more than 7,000 with around 1,000 servers and 6,000 workstation. Just, I think it's very large at that time. And uh, when we come in and do the first assessment, we know that uh, we recognize that all the core service, including Active Directory email servers, they you exchange email servers for on premise, uh, antivirus management servers already compromised. So this is really quite crazy. So I think quite crazy because the antivirus management servers have been compromised from 2015. And um, we also found that all the oper operation, technical operation and security staff team machines are already compromised. And uh, when, we, when we analyze the malware and analyze the pattern, we uncover that the, the adversary we are fighting with is the APT32, very well-known adversary and known as Ocean Lotus the cyber espionage, the state, spouse, the state sponsors group, almost targeting some um, organization in Vietnam for intelligence. So we think that this guy is very a mess and it is chaos when we come and fly with ABT32s. So how can micro attack framework help, help our team in these situations? So uh, before talk about the how we leveraging the 
Mitra Tech Framework, I want to say thank you to Mitra and thank you to Nika. He uh, tracking uh, the APT32 very closely. And uh, in one of uh, he, uh, his tweet, I found that the APT32 in the past already leveraging the McAfee uh, or cache data to deliver and abuse the to deliver the malware. So unfortunately, our customer also use the McAfee or trash data. So it's really crazy and it's quite yeah, stupid. <laughs> yes. So uh, let's talk about um, our hypothesis. Uh, like I mentioned before, the most important thing I, uh, the most important part in the threat hunting with me is the how could we build the hypothesis uh, based on my trust, uh, we uh, and based on our experience almost more than th three years fighting with Ocean Lotus, uh, we believe that they can gain initial access by using spear phishing uh, to gather the valid account and maybe it's uh, the privileged account, some like root account or administrator account. Uh, at that time, uh, um, APT32 uh, leveraging the living of the land binary techniques to do the execution of malicious payloads such as the CMD DOS EE, leveraging the PowerShell or Mista, just like Katie mentioned before. They uh, always try to install some two different persistent techniques by installing some new service or regressive run key to maintain their access to the host and uh, try to stay under the radar by uh, using software packing, DRL hijacking, and file deletion, uh, log deletion maybe. The last but not least in our, in our hypothesis is how can they communicate with the command and control servers? So based on the first assessment and based on our experience, we think, we, we think that the C2 communication can be done should be done use common use port like HTTP port 80, HTTPS or DNS. So this is uh, when we mapping to, when we try mapping to the micro attack navigators, our hypothesis could be look like this. And you can see that our hypothesis do not pointing out how can APT32 collect the data and how could they impact the organizations because uh, we do not have enough data. So let's come and take a look at how we find and uh, how the result from the hunting and incident response process. Uh, before talking about our result, I want to share this uh, gift. <laughs> I think uh, if uh, any threat hunter fighting with uh, have a chance fighting with APT32, we will uh, we know this meaning. Uh, if you don't know, so pull out a list of Pokemons, uh, checking all about the service or new registry run key, maybe you will find some evidence of APT32s. Because in the last four years, uh, APT32 lied to leveraging Cobalt Strike, creating the payload or or malware with the Pokemon names, and uh, in the tweet, uh, in the Twitter of Nika, they uh, he also share a threat hunting tip for hunting the Pokemon malicious service, and th this is very interesting. So I uh, I also talk with my team. So gotcha, get them all. Let's get them all. When we come in, we because we know that all the core service already compromised, so we try to deploy our independent hunting stack, including the endpoint detection for covering all the endpoints and covering more than 7,000 endpoints. Uh, customer also have a CM, but we also try to deploy our own data lake for gather all essential services such as DNS proxies, Active Directory authentication log, because their CM is quite slow and could not enable our threat hunter to do the, the their job. We also try to find the best app in the network by deploying the advanced threat detections, uh, Microsoft advanced threat analytics to, to detect any kind of suspicious or malicious uh, payload uh, attacking to the active directories. 
the network detection and response we try to integrating with some threat intelligence feeds and the our own sandbox for analyzing some any malicious files or malicious uh, payload found in the network. Uh, our team try to leveraging the open API of all the stack we deploy in to automate loss of our work. And we try to quickly, quickly deploy data acquisition script across the enterprise infrastructure. It means more than 1,000 server and 6,000 workstation. We preventing, we automating the prevention of active communication to the command control servers by endpoint isolations and binary isolation. And finally, we're speeding up the cleaning malware in the remediation process by removing binary file, executable files, or any malicious service and registry run key. So uh, at the end of the day, we discover that many, many bad things happen and we discover more than uh, we discover 30 C2 domains and uh, 12 C2 IPs. Uh, in that, we have uh, found that more, uh, four C2 domains have never seen before. That means this domain is cre created for this campaign targeted in our customer. Uh, a lot of servers, a lot of client workstations were compromised multiple malware artifacts, we try to divide into different groups such as binary files, including .exe, executable file or dynamic link library files, some scripting, PowerShell script, C sub script, GIS, .NET, many, many things else. And I could not include in this line. Web shell, uh, some uh, public servers, some uh, public web application already been compromised by uploading some web shells and uh, it's now always a PFP script and a lot of C2 payload we found in the registry and the malicious service, APT32 is for persistent and executions. That sounds like a lot of work. Um, so I think yes. we're running on time here, but thank you for sharing. This has been, a, this has been amazing. And, and I think the, the big question I had for you was, you know, you mentioned the difference between threat detection and threat hunting. Um, what is your kind of, you know, any advice you can share with the community in terms of how do you get those teams to work together? It's like you said, it's getting ahead of the adversary versus, you know, responding to what happens. And what, what advice can you share there? So uh, in, in our organization to have the both team working with each other, we use the, uh, some guy like train their roles. Like we have a four months working as threat detection. The next three months, they can work at Threat Hunters to gain another perspective of another team. And they can share their result from, from their work to see the to see the result and gain help each other to gain knowledge about the other phase. So I think this kind of approach uh, can leverage both of Threat Detection and Threat Hunters. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. So thank you so much for sharing. I mean, we know it's really late there. So def we definitely appreciate you staying up to, yes. to be with us. Uh, so definitely hang around. Um, I know hopefully you're not too tired, but you know, we got some questions in Slack. So uh, pop over there, but thanks again for sharing. Thank you guys. Thank you both of you. And so we have our uh, last external speaker of the session up next, uh, introducing Jacob Benjamin. Hello, and thank you all for the opportunity to talk to you about how we can use MITRE ATT&CK to create cyber DBTs for nuclear power plants. Oh, can't change my slide. Okay, so I am Dr. Jacob Benjamin. I'm a director of professional services at the industrial cybersecurity firm Dragos, and my background is in computer science and nuclear engineering, and my research areas usually focus on the overlap of those two disciplines. So let's talk about DBT. So DBT stands for Design Basis Threat, and the concept was introduced in 1979 by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, or the NRC, and simply put, it's an adversary profile, and it includes details about the adversary, such as the type, the composition, and their capabilities. And so nuclear power plants use DBT as the key input for designing their systems that protect them against acts of radiological sabotage or prevent the theft of special nuclear material. And so each plant will have a DBT and the regulator, the NRC, expects them to be able to demonstrate that they can defend against that. Um, so how are they made? Well, traditionally DBTs are developed by analyzing credible threat intelligence and examining past nuclear security events. 
And so the output is a list of potential adversaries and their attributes, characteristics, uh, possible actions they may take. And then an analysis is done that determines whether specific adversaries are relevant to that site or their targets. And ultimately you get a specific DBT to that facility. And then the physical uh, protection experts at that site design the system and then regularly assess it based on this DBT. And so while a site's DBT is almost always classified or restricted information, I have an example here from the International Atomic Energy Agency. And as you can see, it describes the threat as a team of people, like six people here, and they're attempting to steal some plutonium. And so it includes specific details about the targets and their capabilities, right? And so this information is then used by the physical protection experts to design the defense systems. So for example, this DBT lets us know that the physical barriers there need to withstand 10 kilograms of uh, TNT explosive. And so that's really useful information for designing your physical protection system. And so after designing the defenses, physical security experts will regularly assess them. And so an assessment of the defenses comes down to a function of time. So specifically response time versus adversary time. And so they have sensors and those are usually categorized in terms of their performance and detection probability or false alarm rate. Uh, you also have barriers such as fences, walls, and doors. And those are characterized in terms of delay or the time it takes an adversary to overcome them, right? And so the goal of the system designer is to interweave detection and delay measures in such a way that it allows the reaction force to interrupt and neutralize the adversary before they get to their uh, the goal within that designated time frame. And so this approach allows physical protection systems, allows the experts to predict, control, and like quantify the performance of their defenses, right? And so we can and should use these same principles with cyber. And so, well, what about cyber DBTs? Well, this approach wasn't done for cyber. So in 2002, when cyber was added to the long list of threat actor capabilities that plants need to consider when developing their DBTs, uh, they opted to not use it. So instead of doing that, they decided to address cybersecurity through the application of prescribed cybersecurity controls. So this is like the NIST 800. Uh, they changed them and I've got them on the slide here, the ones they specifically used. But um, it should be known that, uh, that there's no research has ever been done that really shows that uh, compliance-based approaches like this have had, a, had an effect on actual safety or security issues. And um, Sorry, I lost my place there. Okay, uh, so the unfortunate reality here is that this compliance-based approach has left plants unable to quantify the effectiveness of their cyber protective measures, right? And so, and I'm talking about specifically like how they would go up against a TTP of an adversary in a cyber manner, right? So they can only determine compliance, not security. Um, I postulate that they chose this approach due to the following three challenges, right? And so, these are challenges that I believe using MITRE ATT&CK can help you overcome. So the first of which is the rapid evolution of the cyber threat landscape. And this is, you know, it's constantly changing. And so the ability to describe it accurately and update it on a regular basis is difficult. Um, the second being the modeling software that they use for this uh, usually focuses on equipment failures. And so that results in inaccurate modeling of cyber initiated events. And then third, there's also this concept of maloperation, right? And so for power plants, maloperation of a system is often a worse outcome than commodity malware. And so we, we most notably saw this with the Ukraine events in 2015, where adversaries gained access to operational systems and then opened the breakers to, uh, to cause an outage, right? So as a, as a threat behavior lexicon there, attack can help us accurately describe the landscape. Uh, it can help with adversary emulations, like some of the other speakers today talked about, uh, as well as it can help us um, study and evaluate past events and their, relevant, their relevance to us, right? And these are all steps that we need to do in traditional DBT analysis. And so we can use these, uh, we can use the power of attack with these three inputs of past cyber events and intelligence and our site-specific targets to, to get an output that's detailed and has quantitative data that can be compared against our defenses, right? And it's gonna be specific to our facility um, or the adversary actions against our facility. So for past events, we may look to things that have happened in the nuclear sector or the energy sector overall. We can also expand to other sectors if desired, right? And so for threat intelligence, 
There's lots of sources for that. You can get it from CISA or threat intelligence firms such as Dragos, uh, as well as notifications from your, your system vendors or OEMs. They, they oftentimes send uh, notifications as well. And then the last part there, but definitely not the least, is we have to have an understanding of our systems and their value as potential targets to adversaries. So what are our high consequence events and what are the pathways that lead to them? And so I have a quick example that we can walk through. Okay, so uh, we have targets at our facility. We've got a safety instrumentation system, we've got turbines, we've got backup generators, right? And so now we have to ask relevant questions like what past events have happened in our vertical or that involve these systems? Who targets our industry? What kind of systems or the kinds of systems that we have? And if they do target our systems, what weapons or TTPs would they use against them, right? And so this one's pretty easy to pick out. I've got some samples there. So we have a safety instrumentation system or a SIS, and that was targeted by Xenotime in 2017. With the, they developed the Trisis malware that was specifically designed to attack that, right? And so we can use our intelligence feeds to get TTPs that Xenotime uses. So let's see if we can put that all together and create a cyber DBT like the example one, but for cyber. And so this cyber DBT gives us actionable items for defense requirements. It highlights the likely targets, uh, in this case, a CIS, and it's high consequence event, the loss of safety, right? It includes known behavior of the adversary's uh, TTPs. It also informs us of their sophistication or their intent. It lets us know that they understand ICS and they want to cause harm, right? And so, there's a little bit here about insider and this, this lets us know that we don't have to focus on an active insider. And I'm not saying we shouldn't defend against the active insider. I'm just saying that Xenotime hasn't been observed compromising insiders in their attacks. And so it might be something we, we prioritize later, right? And so using threat intelligence, we can obtain a list of Xenotime TTPs. And because they are described in attack, it's easy to identify their associated mitigations, right? And so for here, we have 14 of them for five TTPs. And usually resources are limited, so we may need to prioritize some of these over others. Um, as we have some mitigations that cover multiple TTPs, it makes sense to take a look at those first. So with that mindset, we can get an initial coverage of Xenotime if we implement three mitigations, multi-factor authentication, antivirus, and um, restricting web-based content. However, we probably wouldn't stop there. Like we would likely want to have some mitigation overlap, especially with an adversary as sophisticated as Xenotime. And so it makes sense to add additional mitigation layers with limit access to resource over the network, M1035, and network segmentation, M1030, as those also cover multiple TTPs. And network segmentation tends to be the number one recommendation uh, from our services team, as well as in CISA reports. And so we would just continue to add these mitigations as we could until we're satisfied with our coverage or our, our risk level. And so this slide has just a diagram that's showing the coverage of the mitigation over the TTPs. So using the TAC can also help us uh, with our measuring our detection capabilities. And so here you can see I've broken down Trisis, the malware that Xenotime used in their safety instrumentation attack by its threat behaviors. And so I have used a, a mixture of enterprise attack and attack for ICS, uh, but that's because uh, safety instrumentation system is ICS. So it's gonna have behaviors of both there, right? And so you can see, we're gonna focus on scripting T853. Uh, and that's because Trisys used uh, a compiled Python script, right? And so we don't wanna just detect that specific Python file or Python scripts in general, but um, all of scripting. So this helps us if Xenotime switched to PowerShell or to Visual Basic, right? And so this ensures that we have resilient detections based on threat behavior and not simply indicators. And so as I start to wrap up, I just want to clarify that, you know, cyber DBTs, you know, you can, you can now use a traditional process, right, uh, that, was, that we couldn't use before. Like MITRE ATT&CK enables us to use that known traditionally good process, but for cyber. It really helps us correlate those disparate data sources in, into a way that we can really understand. And we focus on the threat behaviors to to get to, to correlate things from our systems and our intelligence, as well as um, past events, right? So why should you use DBTs or cyber DBTs for your area, right? And so cyber DBTs can measure the effectiveness of the mitigations and detections in the terms of the threat behaviors that they detect or address. Instead of simply saying, hey, we're compliant with this regulation, we can actually have some kind of measurable data. Uh, cyber DBTs can be used to develop and test incident response playbooks, 
And then these scenarios are more realistic for that facility and likely result in more meaningful drill or exercise when they're conducted. And that's inevitably gonna result in better trained personnel from like a, a training perspective, better prepared, right? And uh, lastly, DBTs allow defenders to properly scope their defenses. Like, so with the current approach, cyber is unbounded. Uh, and what I mean by that is that plants are required to defend against all adversaries, regardless of their sophistication or state sponsorship. And so having a DBT can help plants or having a DBT specific for cyber can help plants identify when they're in like a uh, beyond design scenario and they can call in support from CISA, the FBI or incident response firms. And so as I'm talking about like in the beginning with the six folks and the guns, like if they show up with a tank, that's beyond my design scenario. And I'm gonna need to know that I need to call backup. And we need to have the same thing with cyber because it's unfair to say, hey, you have to keep out all of the X-Men, right? Like that's like an impossible thing. Um, and so with that, I'm, I'm down to questions and hopefully you've got some good ones for me, Jamie. Yeah, excellent presentation. And first off, I love the Twitter name. I was like, I immediately know what you're talking about. So that's fantastic. Um, actually, I'm going to borrow one of the questions from the Q&A. It's actually a really great question is, you know, um, as cyber practitioners, we know that, you know, ICS, nuclear, all these are different environments and a lot of the same security paradigms carry over, as you said, even the attack framework, you know, we can, there's a lot of ideas that we can just kind of apply this domain, but also there's a lot, there's a big learning curve in terms of exactly everything you talked about. Um, that's non-traditional for a lot of folks. So what is kind of your best advice for, you know, um, you know, bring people up to speed. And even if you're talking to like a CISO or something like that at a higher level, how do you kind of get them in the right mindset where they're able to understand, you know, traditional security approaches that we have might not directly apply, but there's you no know, additional things exactly as you outlined that we can do in this space. Yeah, I think the big thing there is exactly what the attack uh, encyclopedia brings to, brings to the world, right? It gives us a common language to talk to CISOs and to talk to, we can use that same language when we're talking to CISOs as well as the system engineer. And so we can, so we can look at that impact column of the attack and use that to find the high consequence scenarios when we're talking to a process engineer. And then, then that is like more definable. It's not saying, hey, we got, um, we're domain admin on this network. No, it's like, what can you do with domain admin? Oh, I can cause like a loss of safety because I can now send unauthent unauthenticated commands directly to your uh, PLC or your controller, right? And so when we can get that language and we can speak it so that everyone's understanding, it's really important, right? And so then we can, then we can focus on the right problems and prioritize them. Um, so yeah, just having that common language is really important. And then, yeah, we, we, there's so much information out there from all these different sources. So being able to bring them together using attack is really powerful. Yep, excellent, Thanks. yeah, definitely. Um, and I, actually, I think we're just hit, uh, hit our time, but definitely hop over to Slack and uh, answer any questions and responses there. But thanks again for your time. And, yeah, thank uh, you for having me. Yeah, with that, we're gonna hand it back over to Adam to introduce our last speaker. Yeah, thank you. And and sticking with the theme, um, our final speaker is actually from the attack team. It's our attack for ICS lead, Otis Alexander. And I can see your slides. All right, perfect. Can you, can you hear me? I can hear you too. Perfect. Thank you, Adam. So what I'll do is I'll quickly give an update on attack for ICS. I'll let you know what we kind of got accomplished last year and what's on the horizon. So um, this is our press release uh, when we released attack. It's kind of surreal looking at this because I have a hard time believing that this was released this year. It seems like two years ago. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, January 7, 2020, we released attack for ICS and it's a knowledge base that uh, explains adversary behavior against industrial control systems. So given the short amount of time around 11 months we've gotten a lot of attention around attack for ics um, from different entities in the ics community and we couldn't fit everybody on this slide but what i want to say is thank you to everybody who talks about how they use attack for ics and why it's important to the community so in um, the first blog post I released uh, upon release of Attack for ICS, I kind of talked about what were some of our short-term goals in terms of Attack for ICS. What do we want to add to it? 
Um, and one of the big things I talked about was, you know, the insecure by design nature of a lot of the components and networks and, and the like in the industrial control system. So we thought it would be prudent to first think about the mitigations that are associated with uh, the adversary behavior and the techniques. So our approach to that was to use uh, attack for enterprise and see what mitigations they had, how they apply to um, the techniques that we've put into attack for ICS, and then kind of figure out where the gaps were. And we found some gaps and that um, ended up in us creating 17 new mitigations that really focus on industrial control systems. So where applicable, each mitigation has a mapping to IEC 62443 and NIST 853 uh, in the info box of the mitigation. So you can use that to kind of cross-reference um, security controls. And what we really try to do is to think low level, uh, what would we, uh, what do we think would most benefit embedded controllers as well as the networks? But we really had a, a focus on embedded controllers, uh, protecting the operational and management interfaces there. And from an asset owner operator, perspective you may say hey i can't do anything there uh it'll mess up my certifications and you're, you're most likely correct uh and we just want everybody to understand that there's multiple stakeholders we're talking to in terms of these mitigations so asset owners operators integrators device vendors security vendors they all have their part in kind of implementing these mitigations so some other very exciting news is the sticks and navigator integration. We got a lot of ask about, you know, when will we be integrating these tools and uh, would, would they be able to uh, use these and leverage them? So as of attack version eight, we released attack for ICS and sticks. So now you can ingest it in your tools. Uh, you can use it more programmatically. And then also some good news is with the new version of Attack Navigator, uh, you're now able to pick ICS as a domain. So now you can look, um, use it uh, in visualizations and uh, anything else you wanna do with Navigator there. So we're moving towards uh, more integration and we hope that you enjoy using these tools with um, I Attack for ICS. So those are some of the highlights from last year. What's on the horizon for us? Well, one thing we really want to do is focus on data sources this year. Uh, so these are really important to us. Uh, maintaining visibility into ICS networks uh, is kind of in its infancy. Um, it's essential, however, for quickly detecting and remediating cyber threats. So understanding the various data sources ahead of time before something happens is a key endeavor uh, to this mission. Uh, while network traffic is really popular, it's king right now, you see a lot of passive network detection solutions coming out. There are other valuable data sources that are often overlooked. And some examples are here embedded device logs. So we do see some companies doing some active polling. Um, various application logs associated with engineering applications or HMIs and the like, and then operational databases such as work order databases, historians, and the like. So there's a lot of options out there. And the way we're really thinking about this is what do these data sources provide us at a, a high level and what is attached to these high level categories. So some things that we're looking at are process information. So various events that can um, clue you on to command execution if you miss it over the network or you need some way to corroborate what you see over the network. Also asset management is very important. So condition-based monitoring, predictive maintenance, how is your equipment running? Is there any problems there? And does that link up with other events that you've seen or even things like work order databases so a uh, program download isn't necessarily bad but did the program download happen when it was supposed to happen so this is something that we're really excited about getting into um, attack for ics and really refining what we have so far and last, last but not least, um, we want to include the ics attacks and enterprise attacks so one of the key um, uh, tasks that we have is mapping these attacks to enterprise techniques. So you can see here, these are um, some 
attacks that we are focusing on right now, Stuxnet, Ukraine 2015, and Destroyer and Trident. And we're really responding to what we've heard from industry and kind of what we've always said is you kind of need to use these two knowledge bases together because adversaries don't respect theoretical boundaries. And it's important to have a deep understanding of how they leverage IT platforms to uh, access and impact ICS. So we really want this to uh, help explain the full gamut of adversary behavior. And as always, we need your help. Uh, this is a community effort. So we always are curious about how we can improve attack for ICS. Um, things that we're doing are um, how are you using it? So for instance, the mitigations, are you currently using them? We've heard some great stories from the device vendors so far. And do you have any opinions about um, the direction that we're taking, uh, specifically in terms of our data source focus? How would you do it? What do you think is important there? So that's all I have. Thank you. Always feel free to reach out. Uh, let us know if you have any questions. Yeah, and um, Otis should be available um, for questions in, in Slack. Uh, we've got one set up for him. Uh, and you know, running a couple minutes over, but thank you again to all of today's speakers. Thank you to, to Jamie as well. Uh, and for everyone for joining us today. Uh, there's been some great discussions in the Slack in people's various channels. Uh, hopefully this discussions there will keep going even after we're done here. Links to videos and slides from today will be emailed to everyone who registered. Yes, today's session was recorded. Uh, please join us for our next Attack Con Power Hour on January 14th. Registration should be open today. And thank you again for joining us.